Wonderful. Uh, I welcome to the panel on sustainable economy and resilient society in North Korea here at the Korea Global Forum for Peace. This panel was organized by the International Institute of Korean Studies at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK, that is. My name is Hannes Moslam, the moderator of this session, and I must say I'm very glad that I was invited to chair this panel because it addresses the very interesting and important question of what comes after the sanctions against North Korea, or better, what could come after the sanctions. And so this research, I think, is very valuable, this discussion, because it engages with the future, which hopefully will be brighter for North Korea too. But before we talk about the future, analysis of the past and present comes first, of course, and that is why the panel starts with two presentations on what has been going on within the context of the sanction regime and its implications for North Korea. And here we will hear from Professor Kevin Gray at Sussex University what has been going on in the important apparel industry in North Korea, which then is followed by the presentation of Professor Nick Alsford at the University of Central Lancashire. And as I understand, Nikki will talk about the Marshall-like plan for developing North Korea. And the second part, then, we hear from Professor Virginia Jelicek from Aston University about the case study involving Cuba. And finally, then, Professor Sojin Im, Sojin Im from the University of Central Lancashire, um, who will give us insights into her case study on Myanmar. Each of the presenters will have 15 minutes, and after we listen to all four presentations, there will be two other colleagues who will then discuss the four papers, and this will be Professor Christopher Green from Leiden University in the Netherlands and Professor Marco Milani at the University of Bologna in Italy. And as I understand, each of the discussions will talk about for about um, uh, 10 minutes each, and we'll talk about uh, two of the presentations that we have listened to. Unfortunately, um, according to the plan, at least, we won't have time for questions from the floor. So time schedule is tight like a corset, but that shall not inhibit us from having fun here today. Not to speak, of course, of the great learnings from our exchanges that I'm very much looking forward now um, to hearing from you. In particular, also, I'm very much looking forward um, to this panel because it's a perfect example how well people from the EU can cooperate with people from the UK <laughs> and vice versa. You might have noticed that we have four islanders here and three continentals here on our panel. But now I shall stop blathering, become silent and let the real talk begin. Kevin, if you could be so kind to do the talking for the next 15 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So, um... I believe that my slides are now shared with you. So um, if that's all okay, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead. Um, one of the um, challenges in talking about the North Korean economy is, of course, is like pretty much every other country in the world, it's in the middle of a pandemic at the moment. Uh, it's been, and perhaps more so, it's been very adversely affected both by the pandemic itself and by the measures that it's adopted to deal with the uh, pandemic. Um, but even before then, of course, we had the um, onset of maximum pressure sanctions, and, and which uh, led to a very sharp uh, curtailment of, 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 of trade. But as the pandemic recedes, and uh, potentially, um, perhaps optimistically, there may be some uh, space for a diplomatic, uh, diplomatic breakthrough, um, I think it's worth thinking about possible future possibilities of the North Korean economy, not just on ungrounded um, blue sky thinking, but looking at the pre-existing trends that we were seeing in the North Korean economy in the mid-2010s, before the onset of these very strict sanctions and then the, the, the uh, pandemic. So, um, um, of course, everybody... Uh, right, okay, hold on. Um, I think I'm going to have to do this manually. Okay, um, so as is well known, um, you know, China, uh, North Korea, since the uh, crisis of the 1990s, um, saw a degree of economic recovery based on the basis of its trade with um, China. Um, this was very much based on, um, excuse me, on 
mineral exports um, accounted for the for the large proportion. Um, Haggard and Noland in their 2018 book actually said that um, the North Korean state was in the process of uh, becoming a, a kind of rentier state on the basis of its heavy reliance on uh, mineral resource exports. But I think what this uh, neglects is that by about 2015, 2016, North Korea um, also became extremely reliant on um, textile exports. And by 2017, this actually uh, accounted for the uh, uh, majority of, of North Korean exports to uh, uh, China. Um, which, of course, decreases the possibility that North Korea is going to become this kind of mineral export uh, rentier state and, and uh, uh, you know, ex exposed to all these uh, vulnerabilities associated with the resource uh, uh, curse. But what kind of um, textile industry is this? So, basically, um, this is what's known as consignment-based processing. So, that's, in a way, the kind of lowest rung of global production networks in, in textiles. Um, so what happens is Chinese enterprises um, supply the capital, they supply the equipment, um, the materials, and basically what North Korea does, um, it supplies the, um, the labor and the production sites, the facilities. Um, when I say North Korea, I'm talking specifically about um, uh, state uh, trading companies. Uh, and then, so it's like a workshop, and then and then these uh, uh, sort of items of clothing they are then uh, re-exported back to uh, uh, China. Um, so we see a growth in this these exports from about sixty seven million US dollars in two thousand and seven um, to seven hundred forty one uh, uh, million um, by uh, the mid two thousand and ten, so two thousand and fifteen. And as I say they became North Korea's largest exported item. Um, but what this consignment-based um, processing arrangement means is that um, this is not just an export industry, it's also import dependent, right? You know, so it's importing all the, all the components and parts and then it's, it's, it's exporting the assembled uh, uh, product. And so when we look at the trade data, trade data, we see the exports, but we also see um, a huge increase in the imports of artificial fibers, of, of knitted goods, and these kind of things. And of course, this trade is governed by capitalist dynamics, right? It's, it's, it's um, for North Korea, they want to earn foreign exchange, of course, like any other country engaged in this kind of trade. For China, it reflects the increasing labor costs within China, labor shortages in the northeast of China. Um, and particularly economic difficulties faced by textile companies, especially in, in, in Liaoning province, but also, but also in Jilin province. Um, and if we look at the actual uh, specific import figures, then we can see that, uh, unsurprisingly, it's the northeastern uh, provinces that uh, have uh, imported the most in terms of textiles from North Korea. But um, it's important to say that, that these Chinese companies are themselves integrated into global production networks. Um, so they are often, you know, re-importing the assembled products from North Korea and then exporting them um, ar ar around the world. Um, so, uh, and these include um, many of the world's uh, 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 most well-known um, brand names. Um, um, my friends and family often tell me I don't know anything about fashion, but I am assured that these um, names are, uh, at least some of them are, are very well-known names. Um, now, of course, these companies themselves don't know most of the time that their products are being um, produced in North Korea because they're exported to uh, Chinese companies. Um, and those Chinese companies could be could be anywhere in China. Um, often the trade is uh, you know, the border regulations and laws allow for certain forms of bonded trade where North Korean products can be labeled with a made in China label and then re-exported. Uh, and this is not just about Sino-North Korean trade. It's very much about um, uh, the way that these kind of global production networks uh, um, work more generally. So uh, a Western company or a South Korean company may outsource to a Chinese company, a company like Yong or um, clothing company, but then they would subcontract again to a northeastern company that might be based in Dandong and, or Hunchen, um, who will have their own 
production facilities, but when, for example, production um, orders are very high, they will also outsource some of their production to uh, uh, North Korea. So it's very opaque, but it's it's kind of um, the way things work in these networks anyway. But this also reflects, of course, changes in North Korea. And so there's been a policy emphasis on the, um, the apparel uh, sector in recent years. It also reflects marketization. It reflects reforms to um, corporate governance in North Korea, which allow um, uh, uh, corporations to, um, to engage in this kind of production and engage in international trade. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of... Uh, an, an, North Korean policymakers see the advantage of, of utilizing North Korean uh, sort of comparative um, uh, advantages. So that's the kind of um, trade itself. Now, of course, the clothing sector was targeted by um, sanctions from um, 2017. And so in the 2018, you see a very sort of sharp decline in trade. Uh, overall trade declined to about 2.41 billion US dollars. Now, that increased slightly in 2019, but this was still less than half of what you'd seen in 2016. Um, but one thing, if you look at the official trade statistics, and I'm talking about Chinese statistics, it shows that there's a, a shift then. You know, textile exports are recorded at zero, but there's a shift towards non-sanctioned goods. So you see watches, wigs, uh, laboratory equipment, footballs, shoes. I mean, they are not sanctioned, so they are still able to be uh, uh, exported. Uh, and, and the trade statistics show that. But trade statistics are obviously, there are real limitations when we're relying on the Chinese statistics. And we have to ask the question about whether they are accurate and whether it really is the case that there's, after 2018, there were just no uh, clothing exports from North Korea. As I said, it's based on consignment-based processing. It's not just exports, but it's imports. So um, it's interesting also to look at the imports of the materials for clothing production. So where it shows the exports uh, 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 have sort of gone down to zero, but actually the imports still kind of continued, which is quite odd. Um, and now it's possible that these clothes were then directed towards the domestic market in North Korea, and, and that does happen, but it seems unlikely to have happened at that scale, particularly when most reports suggest that um, consumer purchasing power in North Korea has declined a great deal because of the sanctions and, and, and it's had a sort of um, uh, a dampening effect on, on, on marketization. So it seems that um, somehow this these clothing exports were continuing, um, but they weren't showing up in the statistics. And of course, smuggling is a, is a, is a big issue. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily smuggling across you know, uh, clandestine across sort of non-policed parts of the the, the Tuman or Yalu, Yalu rivers, but but it could be just mislabeling of of uh, customs declarations and things things like that. So um, this the if we look then at the import and export and import statistics more closely, then we can start to see actually that the the export figures alone don't tell the whole story. So that shows a certain kind of a, a resilience to the uh, apparel sector, um, at least until. 2020. Um, now, the other way, of course, that um, North Korea is integrated into global production networks is through the dispatch of, of labor. So, uh, again, sort of up until um, the so, so 2017, 2018, there, there is an estimated about 80,000 um, North Korean workers uh, in China. Um, 30,000 in the Dandong region, about another 9,000 in, in Hunchen, but also other parts of um, China, not just the Northeast, but, but mostly in the Northeast. Um, the, this dispatch of labor is something that's not sort of explicitly approved by Beijing, but it's mostly local and regional governments that um, um, facilitate this. So, for example, the Hunchun uh, uh, government established the uh, Chaoxian um, uh, Tosan Industrial Zone in, in, in the city, which was pretty much set up for this kind of uh, dispatch of, of, of labor. Now, of course, this dispatch was then targeted by sanctions and uh, member states were required to repatriate all North Korean workers by the end of 2019. But there's a fair deal of evidence to suggest that North Koreans continued to be dispatched to China, um, and many re remained in China beyond the deadline. 
Um, and often this was done through sort of, I, I guess you could say illicit means. So instead of going on work visas, North Korean workers would be sent on just sort of tourist visas. Um, but also um, you have um, North, North Korean workers, at least until the border closure in 2020, were able to go back to North Korea and 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 uh, renew their visas. And, and often the um, it wasn't re- legally supposed to happen that way, but 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 um, uh, sort of local government in China actually facilitated that process, and as did employers. Um, but also you, also, also, you have this thing called cross river pass, passes, um, permits for bo- border region residents, which. Um, officially, they're there to allow North Korean residents to visit China um, um, on a temporary basis, um, and then and then return. They visit China to visit relatives, that kind of thing. But actually, what happened was these passes were being given out to to um, workers all across um, uh, uh, North Korea. But what that means is because um, the number of work visas given to um, uh, uh, North Koreans has sort of dried up that's not happening anymore but they're continuing to go on these other sort of um, non-work visas so that allows beijing when they're res- responding to the panel of experts and this kind of thing to claim that well we're not you know north korean workers are, are not entering the country anymore but um in effect they actually uh, are so it's, it's it's an issue about worker status and, and, and who is officially classed as a worker uh, or not so um and, and, and the other point of this, of course, is also that, um, you know, when we talk, we often talk about Sino-North Korean relations, we talk about China as if it's one kind of unitary actor. But as you see with this process of cross-border integration, often it's it's the, the, the kind of operating at different scales. So Beijing says one thing, but then you have the sort of uh, Liaoning and Jilin and, and, and Dandong and, and, and Yenbian governments who are sort of... Um, uh, uh, you know, tackling with the issues of local economic growth and try, actually trying to encourage cross-border trade. And so they're, they're sometimes uh, uh, working at sort of cross-purposes uh, uh, there. And there's an obvious, I mean, the economic interest is obvious because North Korean wages are, are, are just a fraction of, of um, uh, uh, I mean, less than half of what you would have to pay for Chinese workers. Um, and, and for the North Koreans themselves, of course, a, a big chunk of... Um, the payment is taken by the state, but but sort of 40, 50 percent is um, retained by the workers themselves. So it's there's, there's an uh, opportunity for upward mobility. So there's often kind of strong competition for these jobs being sent towards China. Now, of course, 2020, the border closed, and and and, and I think a lot of what I was talking about really um, did uh, uh, come to an end um, uh, as part of the sort of quarantine measures. But I think what I've been talking about at least gives some picture that. Of what may happen um, if North Korea um, sort of comes out of the pandemic and, and reopens its border, and, and even more so if there's some kind of breakthrough on on the sanctions that were imposed since 2017. And in terms of future paths for North Korea, I think um, I mean this is probably not what the North Korean leadership would want to hear, but I think some kind of sort of um you know uh, bangladesh vietnam cambodia sort of integration into uh, global textile production networks based on um kind of um low wage labor um resources seems a, a, a very likely path for the country but I, I'll, I'll finish there because i think my 15 minutes are up thank you yeah thank you very much kevin um for this interesting insight into the subject uh up next is uh, Nikki, who I'd like to invite now to share his screen and start his presentation. Again, Kevin, thanks uh, for keeping time very neatly. So yeah, Nikki, uh, the floor is all yours. Um, okay, I should be sharing my screen. Can everyone see this? Not yet. <laughs> I hope I don't use up the 15 minutes trying to... <laughs> Okay, what about now? Something is coming. Yeah, now it's there. Ah, there we go. Okay, so and I'll you also work out might want to, to start the, the well, how is it called? The, the presentation mode. Okay. Then it's bigger on the screen. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't allow. To, is that but okay? It, and now we have the presentations mode, presentators mode. Yeah, maybe you just skip back to the, to the okay. previous. We're, still, we're working from here. I think it'd be yeah, easier. Yeah, sure. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Hans. It's wonderful to see you and everybody else again. So hopefully the next time when we, we, we can all gather in in face to face as opposed to our maintaining of our discussions this way. Um, I do want to kind of perhaps stress from the beginning that this is very much an idea. It is a beginning of something rather than an end of something. Um, and uh, I think perhaps important to start kind of with a quote. Um, it is a quote on a definition of traditional knowledge. Um, and this is where my research tends to focus primarily on, not just in the case of the Korean Peninsula, but the wider um, Pacific region. Um, I want to just draw on some of the kind of the, the highlights of this as being a cumulative body of knowledge maintained and developed by peoples with an extended history of interaction with the natural environment. And this is part and parcel of a cultural complex. Um, the reason that I want to start with this is that this is very much this conversation, this topic is very much um, germinates from a seed that was planted a number of years ago, I think perhaps 2017, 2018. And if we can start to think about this, been sitting on this, that just how frequently the dynamics change. And when we talk about um, the dynamics of, uh, of North Korea, in particular, we can see that from 2017 to the present, that we've seen shifts, continued shifts. We have the, the latest news of talking about the possibilities of the uh, the reopening of the of the nuclear um, locations, and that's you know part of this change in dynamics. But we've also seen. Uh, shifts, significant shifts in American foreign policy with the evacuation in Afghanistan. So it's all quite hard to kind of to find roots so much within this particular kind of topic because we've got these dynamics. But this is about how we can begin perhaps this conversation. So it all began um, at a conversation that we had at the North Korean all, par all party parliamentary group um, at um, within the Houses of Parliament, within the UK, um, that Sojin and I were invited to attend and, and sit on, um, going back, as I said, to I think was late 2017, 2018. I can't really remember too, too clearly on the specifics. Um, it was chaired by Fiona Bruce, Conservative MP, co-chaired by Laura Alton of Liverpool and Jeffrey Clifton Brown, also Conservative MP for Cotsworth. Um, there wasn't really anything quite remarkable about the conversations within there that you know um it seemed to be pretty standard conversations about talking about North Korea situating North Korea um within its multiple realities um for for everybody on these panels you know the, these conversations are regular topics that come up on any conversation that is had concerning uh North Korea conversations went on on nuclear disarmament uh sanctions obviously was a very key thing human rights these etc cetera, etc cetera. these are the general conversation that was happened um it was in the towards the end of the meeting that they started to talk about possible future scenarios um and these took on um certain social and economic in terms of more liberal reforms within um, the North Korean market. Um, there were conversations on formal designations of the two Koreas. This was happening in and around the time, obviously, we saw greater approachment between the two countries. Um, there was conversations of potential regime change, what, what would happen, um, and th 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 this was centred on that. So we can see that it took from an economic angle through into a geopolitical and a social political. So they, they were trying to cover all the bases within the conversation. Um, and it was proposed towards then that um, what could the UK do um, as part of its global Britain um, in a post-Brexit situation? Is this something that they could do by working 
within the with with Europe in the EU partners in towards devising some kind of package. And this was part of the conversation that drew uh, Sojin and I in, and we followed up that conversation uh, more in depth on the train home. Um, but with all of the situations, it comes with obstacles in every conversation. It's whether or not that all of these ideas, thoughts, processes are happening under sanctions. Um, so do we discuss how uh, we can seek towards kind of maybe forms of aid development within a sanction criteria? Or is this something that needs to be discussed or should we be discussing this in a post sanction? Um, format and if so what are the measures that need to take place for that to happen so these are the kind of the two main obstacles so it became quite clear that in any kind of conversation of a future scenario there needs to be two versions of the same story one under sanctions and one under post sanctions before we could even envisage coming up with some form of an outcome so the proposal of a Marshall Light Plan came out because there were certain keywords, buzzwords that were centering around this all parliamentary group that very much sounded similar to the conversations that would have happened in the late 1940s within the American state houses. Um, issues of the interstate barriers, this opportunity of opening borders, linking towards the, the, the movement of goods, which we saw very much in Kevin's conversation previously, but with the idea that perhaps at some point in the future, we could look towards the movement of peoples, greater movement of peoples. Um, we'd see this within, obviously, along the, uh, along the Chinese borders, but could we see this um, with the South Korean borders? So this opportunity to look towards moving to interstate barriers. The rigid regulations, rigid rather than rigid, my apologies on the typo there. Um, so looking towards the management of corruption, ways in which we could protect, but potentially normalise um, the, the Jamandan market, bolster of a currency, so where we would look towards the currency. Um, then moving and shifting towards greater economic productivity, boosting the economy, promotion of production and facilitating international trade. And all of this seemed to, kind, to me kind of like, um, you know, just these general wishy-washy kind of conversations that happen amongst, uh, you know, within, within government. And I envisage a number of kind of problems within this. And a lot of the problems in which I looked at was this heavy reliance on modernization theory within international development, particularly within those who have in the conversation within parliament. This idea by which, so following on from kind of obviously that President Truman's bold new program um, that was discussed in the 1949, where the benefits of scientific advances and industrial progress will be available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas, kind of really set this precedent that there was a standard by which all were um, uh, all which or all, all things are compared, whether you're underdeveloped, developing, developed. And that, I mean, that very much still kind of exists uh, within the discourse today. So I just felt that there was a, you know, it tends to be an over reliance on this. And, you know, when we start to look at the benefits of the Marshall Plans, obviously, I'll go into a bit, bit further details on that. In actual terms of uh, GDP growth, it only added about, what was it, 0.3% to the general GDP growth. So, I mean, we need to think whether or not that, you know, it to what extent is this type of plan or a plan like this of particular benefit in helping economies to recover or to, to progress forward. Um, the second kind of question that kind of really came out of this is whether or not that economic stability would lead to political stability. And I think that this is a genuine question that needs to be considered before we start to look at ways in which that we could or the way in which the international community could walk towards um, um, working with, with, with the North Korean econ economy. Um, what was particularly clear in in the kind of the, the research with it, which we have done within looking at the Marshall Plan is that there was deliberate ambiguity within how 
aid would be distributed, right? And how the funds could be used. And I think that um, actually that ambiguity could potentially be a kind of important thing. So it's not fixed. There is greater nuance within the way in which it could be distributed. But I do think there is a, or has been a tendency to be an overgeneralization about transition. So the movement from one type of society to another. And I think in doing so, it's ignoring the political implications of growth that we have seen um, at the micro level. So rather than having something that's premised on a notion of a trickle down, that which once growth has been attained, whole population will reap the rewards. We really need to be looking at this at the local level and seeing exactly where need is needed and whether it and, and how that can be best implemented so this idea i've put here in these kind of this important um, markers here is that local culture has in the past been generally ignored by the planner or treated as a constraint and i think this is the central premise of which that if we are to have conversations about aid and distribution of aid we need to be very clear and focused that this this is not something that we are doing in terms of the planning side. So I think there needs to be greater agency within the aid system. And although I presented this in a very structured way, um, the reality is I think that this needs to be far more entangled, something that's better um, interconnected. So we don't just see the distribution of kind of policies, project people and aid amongst government NGOs and private sector, but something that's far more entangled. Um, so if I could just momentarily refer, come back to this original quote that I put at the very beginning um, and start to perhaps draw out from that something of which could be the starting point for these kinds of conversation is that perhaps the Marshall-like plan should be a cumulative body of knowledge that is maintained and developed by peoples with extended histories of interaction with the local environment and are among those who understand and interpret its meaning as part of a wider local cultural complex. And I think here is where it would be important when we start to talk about the distribution of aid that we very much think more at a local level rather than at a top-down level. Um, obviously, the conversation um, the title of the presentation was centred on the EU and why I'm thinking EU in our post-Brexit thing. Why did I not just think of the UK or any, or any maybe more of a, a UN or a more global one? Um, the, the EU, I think, has a result, ha, has a part to play or has a potential part to play because it is a result of the integrative policies of a marsh of the Marshall Plan. Um, the Marshall Plan initiated the European integration, the removal of barriers and the establishment of coordinated institutes. It facilitated um, intra-European trade and allowed the foundation, laid the foundations for the EU. And I think this experience has the potential to put it at the table in any conversations with with North Korea. And I think um, the EU, say the EU plus one, maybe like if we're taking that as the UK can still have, have, have a role within this, be it that it was the largest recipient of the Marshall aid um, back in the back in the 40s and 50s. So kind of I bring this to a conclusion, I think kind of my time is coming to an end. Um, I think any kind of plan, whether it is a Marshall-like plan, because there was lots of things that I'd want differently, so it's looking less like the Marshall plan and more of just a plan. Um, but to think about this in terms of the incorporation of traditional knowledge, I think needs to be centred. It needs to be the central factor, um, and the, perhaps we should seek towards moving towards the ending of these sorts of grand narrative strategies that are looking at things such as modernization theory and these things perhaps moving beyond that is an important important starting point. Um, I think there needs to be certain revisions in the way in which that we look at this in terms of linear structures of development and perhaps start seeking ways in which that we could look at this much more horizontally, the, the inclusion of technical skills, knowledge transfer, and not just seeing this purely as a one-way one development. Um, so if we are to say development, perhaps this 
this idea, this plan should be a development with a small d um, that's incorporating traditional knowledge within its distribution across different ages. So I'm going to kind of end there and thanks everybody for um, inviting me to kind of uh, present this. Um, over back to you, Hans. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, great ideas here, in particular, I think, um, Ah, as, as uh, European countries, there there's a lot uh, um, to do. So to play a part as um, academics, and then you show very well that you're doing that already, have been doing this. So um, thanks a lot for that. Also for keeping time. Next up then uh, will be Virginie. Um, are you ready to lead us into the much nicer climate zone? Then please do so. We're going to the Caribbean. Let's see. Are you able to see this? Yes, we do. I, yes, I, I do. So you do. Okay. Well, then I'll I'll take yes. your words. I'll take your word for it. Um, excellent. So let's go like this because I'm I'm dealing with unfamiliar um, unfamiliar uh, material here, as in uh, in terms of computer and all of that. So thank you very much for. Uh, for having me for 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 this this conference and thanks to the audience especially for uh, for staying on and uh, and listening to all of us. Um, so I'm on the I'm on the continent actually. I'm on, I'm in France. I don't know if I'll be able to to go back to the UK tomorrow. Um, we'll see. I might I might just stay forever on that side uh, and join the uh, the continental uh, group. Uh, as Hannes um, talked about uh, earlier today. So what I'm um, going to, um, to, to, uh, to talk about today is a little bit of, um, of a case study really of what has been going on uh, in Cuba uh, in comparison to, um, to the DPRK, especially when we are looking at, at, at health. Um, so this is part of a research that I've, I've been doing with one of my colleagues, um, Stephanie panishiri Bataya, who is at, um, at Warwick. And over the past two or three years, we've looked particularly at uh, the kind of interaction that DPRK and Cuba uh, have uh, in third countries, especially in Africa. Um, we uh, both uh, traveled um, to, to, to Havana a number of times. You know, I was in North Korea as well. It's been interesting to see some of the, the differences and some of the similarities as well. So essentially what I want to, to talk about today is uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, this contradiction and interaction between countries that are on the one hand called essentially third world orphans, uh, countries that had been uh, former Soviet clients that have been heavily influenced by uh, a number of sanctions as well because of their role and, and location to some extent um, as well. Um, but also at the same time, how they are being brought uh, with some um, a number of initiatives. So we can think, for example, of uh, of George W. Bush's toward the new world order, you know, uh, speech uh, in 1990, where there was a sense that the United States wanted to, to commit to lead the world, uh, wanted to have, uh, to bring on board weaker partners, and wanted to, to essentially reform and change. So on the one hand, there's a sense that those country can change, but then on the other hand, there's a question uh, around sanction and around around behavior, really. Uh, so why have a look at at, at Cuba and, and and North Korea? Uh, on on the face of it, uh, those are countries with really uh, very separate histories. Uh, they are very far from one another. They are over seven thousand miles from one another. And when we have a look at at the past, at at, at you know history, they actually do not interact with one another at all until uh, essentially the uh, the Cold War. Uh, they are country of of similar size in terms of of geography, but quite different when it comes to population. So the DPRK population is around twice that of uh, of Cuba, so one twenty five million uh, for the DPRK. Um, Cuba, however has a, a GDP per capita which is uh, five times more than that of the DPRK. Um, so we see some, 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 some differences there. What ties those countries together uh, is um, that they have been object of colonialism. So we obviously know uh, of the DPRK's colonial past with its experience with, um, with Japan. Uh, when it comes to Cuba, 
We have an independence that's gained in, in 1898 um, after the, um, the Spanish-American War, and then the United States having quite heavy uh, interest after a, a US occupation that will end in 1902, and then quite a lot of American interest that will stay in Cuba, and that will essentially develop Cuba, but also take advantage uh, of of um, um, oil and of a number of other uh, uh, of uh, a number of other resources, um, we see um, a revolutionary past past that's happening at the same time in the 1950s. When on the one hand, and the DPRK, we have you know a, a new country created after uh, the end of World War II, um, led by by Kim Il Sung, was you know a, a, a socialist base to some extent that will then lead to something else. Then in Cuba, uh, we have um, Fidel Castro leading his own revolution against uh, the then government, the Batista government, which was essentially a, a middle class based on, on middle class dissatisfaction. dissatisfaction um, um, a claim that there was a lack uh, of employment, um, their claim that there were political repression. So essentially it's a revolution that will be called socialist later on, but that has a, at its very core uh, providing more for everybody. And we will see this later on when we're having a look at, at, um, uh, at health, the, the basis of the focus on, on Cuba's health uh, 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 investment essentially uh, take root um, with, with Fidel Castro in the 1950s. We also see uh, both countries having a common enemy, essentially the United States, um, on the one hand because of um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, with you know, the Soviet Union, uh, Russia bringing uh, weapons uh, in Cuba, and then an embargo being put uh, on Cuba, and actually you know, Cuba still uh, suffering from, from these decades on later, and then uh, on, on the, um, uh, the DPRK side, you know, the Korean War, uh, the Finnish armistice, and then this, this essentially, this, this, this fight against uh, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the Western world, but at the same time an, an easy relationship uh, with Soviet and, and Chinese powers as well. And finally, a very uncertain future. Um, so um, those countries went through uh, uh, rules uh, with rulers that, that were in place for a very, very long time. Um, so in 2006, Fidel Castro, uh, who was quite ill, decided to actually see, uh, give you know, power to, to his brother Raul. Um, and then later on, uh, in 2018, uh, 2018 uh, we have a new president in Cuba, uh, Miguel Diaz-Canel, um, who is continuing le the legacy, but at the same time, it's, it's not the same legacy. It's outside of the bounds of, of the family. And then, you know, in the DPRK, we have, you know, a history that we are, we are quite familiar uh, with as well. So how do you uh, survive uh, in this post-Cold War environment for, for the DPRK. So I decided to put quite a lot of photos to kind of, you know, distract from, from a lot of text. And uh, some of those things you, we are all familiar with, essentially a push and pull between some uh, bilateral uh, efforts uh, engagement, some military one with, with Kedo, for example, um, some uh, very uh, strict uh, uh, retracting policies with, you know, the uh, axis of evil, for example, that set the tone for quite a lot of the things, uh, some important summits, some important event with Madden Albright meeting uh, uh, Kim Jong-il uh, you know, in 2000, but then also uh, the Trump uh, uh, Kim, um, uh, Kim Jong-un summit. So we have uh, a constellation of uh, uh, sanctions, but at, of back and forth of sanction, but at the same time, you know, negotiation and and I guess to some extent, some of what uh, Nik Nikki was talking about in this kind of you know, Marshall Plan, trying to construct uh, a new a new dimension to um, well, at first, you know, really uh, manage the collapse of the DPRK, and now um, while well, living with a with a DPRK that's not collapsing. Uh, when it comes to Cuba, um, it's quite similar. We are dealing with the same actors. We are dealing with the Clinton administration, uh, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, but we are dealing also with a relationship with other regional powers. So uh, uh, Kevin talked quite a bit about the relationship with China. When you're having a look at Cuba, you're looking at the relationship uh, with the countries around, and that's Venezuela, for example. So in 1990, uh, with the end of this, uh, the, the Cold War and all of that, Cuba was in very, very dire, um, a dire situation, and, and um, economically uh, with a, a lot of shortage and, and um, there was this, this period of special measure in times of peace that was put in place by uh, Fidel Castro um, essentially uh, um, 
very very strict restriction and 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 rationing um and nothing really available in 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 stores or for 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 any sort of consumption um the relationship with other countries especially with venezuela was based on on trade with uh you know oil for doctors so that cuba providing quite a lot of of medical uh medical doctors and and medical supplies uh to venezuela was at the same time venezuela provided oil and a number of other things we have uh, a tightening of sanction also in 1990s with uh with a number of acts you know also signed by uh, uh by billington to little by little essentially get rid of, of fidel castro you know create uh, a, a a democracy uh, or some sort of democratic uh, dem- democratic um, uh, uh, foundation, um, and a tightening under uh, under uh, Donald Trump of, of of all kinds of of of, um, of rules as well. So, the country is at a at a standstill when it comes to what can be brought. Uh, in um, so um, very similar to to what we have in in South Korea, those things have not changed uh, with under Biden. Um, those rules have not been uh, revisited at this point. So I have here, you know, a, uh, a summary of the sanction on, on on Cuba. Those are unilateral. The relationship is mostly uh, with the United States, but there are also some multilateral sanction uh, with the EU. You know, packaged together, but but but, but far less uh, uh, far less sanction and. Uh, a little bit more engagement when it comes to to the EU. We could compare with with the DPRK with UN sanctions as well, but uh, there's also very uh, very little engagement. What is quite interesting, and this is what I want to to really focus on in in this particular presentation, is 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 uh, some aspects. Uh, of of health and so my specs of those areas that both the DPRK um, and and Cuba have been trying to to develop because those are um, to some extent less contentious areas than you know let's say weapons and all of that so there's a voice coming from uh, the developing world or the third world when it comes to you know education to some extent gender equality reducing inequalities for sure um, and and good health and well being. Um, I think the, what we can learn from the, the Cuban example is um, this um, really very intense focus on, on health, which in spite of heavy embargoes and heavy sanction, has managed to, in some areas, um, flourish and to, 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 to create some um, uh, extremely useful uh, medical produce, including uh, COVID vaccines. We will talk about it. I'll talk about it uh, a little bit later. Uh, but the focus uh, for Cuba has always been on providing a universal uh, health care and affordable um, and access to affordable medicine. And that goes back to the very foundation of the revolution. This has led over time to a, a level of infant and maternal mortality, as well as a level of, of, of life expectancy that is to some extent on par with first world countries. And that's no, no mean feat to achieve given, given the economic environment and the insularity, you know, no pun intended, really, of, of, of Cuba as, a, as an island as well. Um, what's very interesting also, there's been a very strong push in terms of research, in terms of medical research. For example, some treatments around the prevention of, of mother to child um, HIV, uh, for example, um, some some vaccine um, that help uh, for uh, lung cancer patients, as well as a very strong emphasis on medical education in the country, but also abroad. So this started in the 1960s with Fidel Castro sending its first medical brigade to Chile and also sending people and healthcare professionals abroad to actually more than 158 countries around the world. Um, Obviously, um, this has um, been supported by the creation of uh, a Latin American school of medicine in a number of countries as well. So this element of training. But what comes behind is 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 essentially um, some sort of trade. You know, it's getting remittance, getting you know monetary support, obviously from the personal being 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 sent abroad. When we compare with the DPRK, uh, uh, the DPRK is really quite far behind when it comes to the own its own development. When it's come to to uh, medicine, even though you know what we read in 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 the North Korean uh, you know press, you know might might aggrandize some of the the things that are actually really being t- taken um, taken care of. Um, we also see this element of, of sending doctors abroad, uh, uh, in, in, especially in, in, in part of Africa. But I wanted to, um, to focus for, for the last few minutes on, well, 
again with without a, a pun you know on, on the covid test essentially because i think this is a, there's a very interesting uh um it's a very interesting moment for us to consider this global pandemic but also the impact of sanction uh and uh how we put, could potentially move towards move beyond some of the sanction to to allow for uh relief uh in some areas so if we go back to what was going on in Cuba a year ago. So in June 2020, Cuba was um, one of the uh, most, um, one of the country with the best result when it came to contain, uh, to containing uh, COVID. So they were, uh, Cubans were uh, 24 times less likely uh, to catch the virus than people in the Dominican Republic, for example, 27 times less than in Mexico, 70 times less than in, in Brazil. Um, but Cuba decided to close its borders very, very late because uh, they didn't want to lose revenue from tourism. This is, you know, one of the, the last, the last stream of revenue really coming into the country and especially people bringing stuff you know with them which then is 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 traded it's a little bit like you know in in in, in oscar as well what they've done is is to follow their own um their own focus on preventative medicine uh, and that meant tens of thousands and thousands of family doctors nurses and medical students being sent for to actively screen all homes in Cuba. They also hospitalized uh, people right away uh, when there were, uh, there were symptoms. And so um, this led to a very, very low, uh, since it was a, a, a track and trace and isolation regime that, that was not based on, you know, a mobile phone, like, you know, we, we tried to implement in the UK and <laughs> didn't really quite manage to, to get there, even though we were supposed to be world beating at it. Uh, the Cuban uh, the Cuban system was, you know, um, very much hands on, but also very much coercive. Um, medical students uh, would not be able to complete um, their their studies if if they were not doing what they were being told, essentially. Um, so um, a lot of coercion uh, behind behind that. So that was last year, where they hospitalized everybody who tested positive, even uh, asymptomatic cases. Uh, a year later. Um, they uh, have one of the highest uh, uh, COVID rates um, compared to last year. And that is mainly due to, to, to shortage uh, and to, to, uh, to essentially nothing being coming in or, 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 or no antibiotics, uh, no painkillers, very basic line of, of medicine lacking. At the same time, Cuba has managed to... Um, so is that five minutes or is it no time, uh, Hannes? Uh, no time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no time. Ten minutes. No. Minute, so, so I wrap up. So they have developed a vaccine. They've been able to roll it out. The sanctions are blocking quite a lot of effort. Cuba has not have a sanction bypass as we've seen in the DPRK very recently with, for example, UNICEF sanction sanction uh, bypass. But I think we are at a point where we need to ask ourselves if a country as isolated as Cuba has managed to develop vaccine with quite proven efficiency, yet we are, be, we are blocking um, the country uh, with, with sanctions. How do we move forward? I think the same case is, is quite similar for, for the PRK as well. And I thank you, and I stop now. Perfect. Thank you very much, Virginie. Um, thanks for, for the great talk. We'll uh, go to the next final presentation, which is uh, by uh, Im so -jin. Please share your screen and shoot. Okay, thank you very much, Hannes and everybody. Um, let me just share my screen now. I believe that you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so here we are. So a very last presentation of the day two, I believe. And uh, yeah, before we have our discussion, of course. Um, it's really good to see everybody online. Hopefully uh, next year we can have another panel again, but in Korea. So we did have our, our panels uh, last year for the um, the this uh, forum, but uh, again it was online because of the pandemic. And um, yeah, as, as Virginia just mentioned about the COVID nineteen, it's not only about the uh, Cuba or the PRK, and so so Korea and the UK and everywhere else. Uh, uh, having difficulties. But anyway, so let me just start. 
Um, as a last uh, uh, presentation, uh, I will talk about the uh, case of Myanmar as a uh, uh, possible future of uh, DPRK, which can face uh, the surge of uh, development cooperation in the country for in post sanction scenario, but even uh, in the partial lift uh, sanction scenario, uh, that is also another case, rather than not only having the humanitarian aid, but also having development aid uh, will be the case. And uh, some uh, critics uh, harshly uh, criticized my ongoing research saying that this is uh, too much utopian like because of the sanction regimes, you know, uh, governments like the US will not never ever uh, even have a partial lift of sanctions and uh, your theory and your argument would not even work. I've, I've been hearing uh, of that quite many times, but nevertheless, uh, at least someone needs to be prepared for the future. And if we really want to have uh, North Korea people having a resilient society and do not leave them uh, le uh, behind, as the uh, sustainable development uh, agenda uh, split uh, says, uh, we really need to uh, now think about uh, what we need to prepare. So that's how my research began. And it is pretty much ongoing. And um, today's discussion and panel uh, comments will be really appreciate, really be, be appreciated for the development of my uh, research. So the research question, uh, questions are like this. Uh, I started with why sanctions were lifted in Myanmar? very basic question. And um, was it because the sanctions were effective or were there any other reasons? And how post-sanctions international cooperation was provided in Myanmar and whether there were any challenges? What I heard from the uh, grassroots uh, uh, level when I uh, used to work for the aid agency in Korea, uh, in when I had the uh, Myanmar visit, I heard from many other uh, development aid agencies that after the uh, uh, sanction lift in Myanmar, they experienced a surge of uh, aid, which I will show you in data later on. Then not only about this managing aid, but also in more realistic um, sense, for example, for the aid uh, agency people to find out where to live, the safety, all these things uh, were not uh, prepared yet in Myanmar. So they really had to struggle. So this uh, question uh, came up from my hands-on ex hands experience. And the final uh, question uh, is, what can be the implications for North Korea in the case of partial sanctions lift or post-sanctions period? And assumes here being is that sanctions will be partially or entirely lifted in no North Korea eventually. So we can't just leave the country like that because people are suffering a lot. And we are observing what has going on in um, North Korea at the moment. And nowadays, uh, the recently we talk more about the ethical uh, approach, the ethics of uh, sanctions as well, in terms of thinking of the people there. So the uh, study aims have three pillars. Uh, the uh, number one is to explore post sanctions international development cooperation in Myanmar, of course, and to analyze implications for North Korea. Then finally, to contribute to future development of North Korea and a resilient society for the people, not for the regime. That is very important uh, part for uh, my research. So the rationale why then we can compare between Myanmar and North Korea uh, can be shown in this uh, simple table. Both countries have sanctioned experience and Myanmar's sanction were not effective. And until today, North Korea's sanction, sanctions do not look effective as we saw from Kevin's uh, presentation, for example, uh, is clearly not effective in terms of changing the regime because the, uh, the fundamental aim of sanctions is to changing the regime, but it's not happening. And because of that, um, I thought uh, this Myanmar and North Korea could be the comparable cases because the regime change in Myanmar was not because of the sanctions, was because of the uh, other uh, factors which I will show you now. And in post-sanctions Myanmar, um, as I said, there was a surge of aid agencies along with their uh, practical uh, difficulties. And also in North Korea, we can uh, easily uh, uh, imagine that how it would be like. And if you see the graph here, 
So the in 1996, the uh, sanctions began in Myanmar, and in uh, 2012, uh, it uh, was lifted. And all of a sudden, there was a huge um, a surge. It's really dramatically uh, raised. So that was the uh, basic um, uh, rationale of the cases. Then the the analytical framework. How I approached to my research. I uh, sort of reviewed the existing uh, literature about the sanctions effectiveness. And my argument is more about the, the ethics of sanctions uh, regime. So the people suffer more than the uh, regime change in most of the cases when we see the experience of sanctions in other countries. And especially countries like North Korea, the information influx or soft fire by uh, the scholar Nai uh, defined, it looks like working better than sanctions. For example, even uh, last week, um, the uh, Kim Jong-un North Korea uh, commanded uh, the Youth League to commit more uh, to this uh, ide ideological um, education uh, 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 sections because now North Korea is more exposed to the external uh, information. And it's not about the information influx now, it's about the cultural influx. And that uh, kind of affected the change of life and society a lot more than before. And for me, it looks like it's more effective in terms of big, uh, bringing the changes in North Korea rather than sanctions. And also uh, we uh, can think of the the possible pathway to build up culture of accountability and institutional capacity by bringing the tailored accountability in North Korea, which means uh, we apply um, customized uh, way of accountability by lifting partial, uh, uh, partially uh, sanctions and uh, bringing more uh, aid workers in the country. And uh, let me just go through the uh, Myanmar sanctions uh, quickly in order to understand um, and how it can bring us the implications. In Myanmar, as we all may well know, uh, the uh, sanctions started uh, with the 1990 military junta against National League for Democracy uh, general election victory. And it ended in 2012 when uh, they brought democratic uh, uh, government. But the reform did not happen as a result of sanctions, but it's more uh, based on these two internal and external factors. Uh, when we talk about the internal factors, there was already dissent uh, from the public against the military regime. Myanmar already had the experience to have this um, the general, uh, general uh, population's uh, demonstration uh, for uh, democracy. So the culture was there. And also the uh, retirement of senior general in March 2011 was the trigger point to bring new power structure. And that is uh, one difference between North Korea and Myanmar, between military uh, regime and um, the personality-led uh, regime, which I will also show you uh, later on. And there was a strong external factors. Uh, for example, under the uh, sanctions, China involved a lot in Myanmar, and there were too much involvement of Chinese government in Myanmar. And the Myanmar, uh, the Burmese themselves felt they need to have a balance, so they invite they uh, felt they need to invite more Western to have a balance in between. So that was uh, one external factor, and also there were uh, the increasing complaints by uh, local residents. I put it as an external factor because. When we talk about the internal factor, it's more about the um, political structure and system uh, in terms of considering the sanctions effectiveness and the, um, the increasing complaints by local residents uh, under this um, uh, junta and also the sanctions uh, were there as external factor to bring um, the change in Myanmar. So as I already said, there was uh, no negative effect on military leaders, which means there was no uh, regime change because of the uh, sanctions in Myanmar. And there were more uh, hardship to people, uh, people's life. So if we uh, compare before and after the sanctions, um, the basic 
uh, needs uh, um, requirements uh, became really worsened uh, in Myanmar's uh, society. But it did not affect to the uh, regime change, but it's, it was more about the people's uh, uh, daily life. And also, again, the heavy dependence on China. So that was the side effect of the sanctions in Myanmar. Then in post uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, post sanctions in Myanmar, uh, the surge of uh, ODA uh, brought uh, really the uh, point uh, we need to think about the capacity of the government and also uh, how people deal with it. So the um, a lot of aid agencies, including multilateral, bilateral, and NGOs, uh, came into this uh, uh, country, but uh, without uh, proper pre-preparation from the uh, Burmese government side. So uh, the unready institutions were there, and lack of a human and uh, institutional capacity uh, was uh, the most problem there. And also, um, the officials at the government side really had a lack of time uh, to deal with all of these uh, required documents. So in order to achieve the accountability, the so-called Western society uh, requires a lot of uh, paperwork in order to make sure the due diligence and uh, the steps uh, which they need. But uh, the Burmese uh, officials uh, were not familiar with that uh, uh, at all. So uh, in 2013, the uh, Myanmar Development Corporation Forum was held for the first time. Uh, but um, uh, it was not uh, the uh, uh, one single solution, and uh, they had to uh, work a bit more. So that is the uh, how it looks like. It's three page of document can't solve all this problem. So this is the uh, bigger uh, graph which I showed before, and as you see, there was the humanitarian aid in between the sanctions um, uh, due to the uh, cyclone, but part of from it really the ODA level was low and then it stepped up uh, after the sanctions. Then the, as I said, the, the from aid orphan to darling of the aid uh, really uh, made the society and the government uh, confused. Uh, civil society um, in the local places did not have the same kind of atmosphere and um, approach and understanding uh, from the uh, central government. And the donors one size fits all approach did not work fair. As uh, Nikki uh, uh, mentioned, the traditional knowledge and the local knowledge uh, were not reflected uh, properly uh, uh, at the beginning. And also um, that uh, leads to the uh, uh, complaint from the local side uh, when um, donors provided aid to, to those places where they more uh, needed the aid. And the uh, national and local power relations uh, uh, was uh, also another uh, issue because of that. And of course, the, uh, there was a lack of accountability based on the lack of uh, institutional capacity. And the corruption was huge in Myanmar, which uh, we can also easily imagine uh, how it would be like in North Korea. So already the uh, corruption in North Korea is uh, really uh, I know, uh, worsened. So, the, uh, the one of the uh, testimonial clearly shows how the situation was like. Um, now people starting to say accountability because people know the word will be useful and therefore everyone is saying that, but real interest can and capacities are very low. They are donor imposed attempts to establish something. This tells me what Virgin is, yes, what Virgin is uh, told us about these SDGs and um, North Korea, Cuba government, they all uh, looks like cooperate with this UN uh, regime, but because they know these will work in terms of bringing more uh, aid, they just use the word, but they do not actually practice them. So the implication for North Korea, we now uh, uh, know that the sanctions anyhow are not effective. And also civil society support really worked in Myanmar and that will be one of the, could be one of the keys in North Korea. And we also really need to build up the pathway uh, of the culture of accountability by bringing um, the uh, more aid in the regime. So uh, this is a simple uh, preliminary findings um, in comparison between uh, Myanmar and North Korea. And in North Korea, there are uh, a lot of differences in terms of to have a reform. Because of that, uh, we really need to think about 
uh, out of the box. So no more real uh, the uh, uh, the uh, approach to the uh, harsher sanctions, but maybe we need to step back and provide a partial uh, sanction lift and try to impose the accountability there. Then if uh, there's uh, anything goes wrong, then anyhow, we can uh, resume the uh, uh, harsher sanctions afterwards. So we need to uh, rather see the constructive way rather than uh, punish uh, uh, the, like the uh, sanction uh, work, bring the uh, uh, sanctions like a punishment. So that was the mainly about my uh, ongoing research and still I'm really puzzled because North Korea is very unique case compared to any other cases in the world because the society and the country itself really locked down and um, the regime doesn't look like uh, to be changed in the uh, near future. So um, the comments today uh, will be really helpful for my uh, uh, further research. Thank you. Thank you very much, so Jin. Interesting, very interesting, and I think it will be uh, discussed uh, much controversially, um, and it is right. So, so um, I'm sorry for the for the for the time regime. Uh, you know, uh, it's pushing off the cliff is the sanction <laughs> which kick in. So, uh, Christopher, please, I'd like to invite you for discussion there. Thanks very much, um, and I will try and dial back my comments by a couple of minutes at least to, to give as much time as possible for everyone to, to talk. Um, first, thanks, of course, to the, to the organisers for bringing us together for a conversation like this that we would not really easily be able to have uh, otherwise. Uh, I really enjoyed those four presentations, gave me much to think about. I now have a dense couple of pages of notes. Um, I'm sorry if there's an echo on, on, on the sound here. I'm in a in, in a room that isn't particularly well uh, set for this kind of thing, so I hope it's uh, okay. Um, I'll try and make some sense of what I have been thinking about while listening to these excellent presentations. Um, first, uh, thinking about Kevin Gray's uh, work on, on textiles and labour exports, uh, I thought he did a, a really interesting and great job of, of pointing out how we cannot readily now disaggregate issues of COVID border closure and COVID uh, related self-imposed harm that the North Korean government has, has put in place from longer term trends um, and the effect of sanctions. Uh, it's it's a 2020-21 is a black swan moment for North Korea as it is for a lot of places. So it's a bit of a difficult uh, moment in which to try and to organise our thoughts on these things. Uh, Kevin pointed out uh, how sanctions criminalise uh, the state, and that's true. Uh, how did they do that? As he as he said, they they push uh, illicit activities in the direction of illicit activities, and they 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 force organisations within North Korea to use quote unquote so called illegal means of achieving goals that were legal previously, and and the the issue of how to keep workers labour exports in place in Russia and China. Uh, and to a lesser extent, the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, through the use of short-term visit visas and other uh, measures is a great example of that. And the way in which uh, textile imports continue while textile exports do not, and, and as Kevin pointed out, the likelihood that this is a consequence of all production going into the domestic economy is essentially zero. So it's criminalizing these activities uh, in a way that is, is perhaps unhelpful. But I have a, a problem with the question of what constitutes effectiveness of sanctions. I mean, I think we all agree notionally that they're ineffective um, in that they don't achieve some of the goals that are ostensibly ascribed to them, right? Nuclear denuclearization has not taken place in North Korea, quite the opposite, right? So from that perspective, sanctions are ineffective. But I thought in, in Dr. Lim's presentation, this was taken as read when there is the question of keeping North Korea in conditions where the costs of doing business are high and most countries or organizations would prefer to avoid it. Uh, and therefore, North Korea is kept in a condition of relative poverty. Um, and that is something that then presents an example to other actors in the world. Uh, persuading them that, the, that to follow international norms, especially surrounding nuclear nonproliferation, is preferable for them 
over the long run. So there is the question of whether that constitutes effectiveness. So, I mean, that's, a, that's a, in some sense a side issue, but I think it does loom large over discussion of removing uh, sanctions. I think also Kevin Gray then moved on to ask the question of whether all of this came to an end in 2020. Um, and I think, you know, in general terms, he's quite right to say that, yes, it did. But it does uh, force us to think about the ways in which it didn't and what the implications are there for our understanding of the situation, at least now and probably for the next uh, few years to come. Because as although Dr. Gray said that the pandemic is receding into the past, and we all certainly hope it is, it certainly isn't receding very quickly in North Korea, um, which has mostly by its own design, rejected some offers of, of vaccines through the COVAX facility and therefore is going to be facing a lot of difficulties imposed by COVID uh, for some significant period of time to come. At the same time, we've seen that uh, there was a, a, a reports have emerged in the last few days that North Korea has imported somewhere in the vicinity of 20 million US dollars of goods in the recent past. And of course, that's a drop in the ocean. Um, compared to uh, the years before the pandemic, but it has been uh, going on. So there is some cross-border trade. And it was really fascinating to think about uh, Dr. Gray's work in comparison to with a preliminary project that I'm doing now uh, in the under the aegis of, of International Crisis Group, which uh, looks at nightlight data. Of course, we're not the first to look at nightlight data. Uh, but nightlight data, uh, preliminary findings suggest that it demonstrates a, a very strong trend in pushing trade, cross-border ex exchanges of goods. I don't know whether it's licit or illicit, but it certainly is moving east uh, along the Yalu and to the Tumen River border crossings, because it's always been the case that our capacity to know what cross-border trade is really happening is mostly focused on the dandong Shinriju crossing. And that's, of course, logical in normal times because most of the trade does indeed go across there and it goes down to Pyongyang from Shimiju. So that's fine. But we're seeing in the nightlight data spikes around the time when nightlight data for Dandong Shinuiju goes down. So nightlight data for, for crossings at uh, Manpo and uh, Heryong, uh, Musan and then not really Rasan, which is <laughs> this research has demonstrated the irrelevance of Rasan in many ways. Um, as, a, as a part of the, the wider North Korean economy. But these intermediate, these border crossings up in the hills where people don't tend to be watching have seen spikes in nightlight data. This concept of, of state-led smuggling, um, which uh, Asia Press has been at the forefront of documenting uh, in, in the last couple of years, I think is relevant here. So that was really interesting connection between uh, Dr. Gray's work and uh, something that I'm working on myself. Um, I think another point that came out of Dr. Gray's presentation concerned how the Chinese government is not, in economic terms, a unitary actor. There are It does, quote unquote, operate at different scales. That's very important. And it's worth adding that, in fact, although perhaps not quite to the same degree, North Korean entities operate at different scales too. Uh, I have a uh, an example from my own travels in Dandong, where I attempted to have a conversation about setting up uh, a, a cross-border uh, business using uh, North Korean wood, as it happens. And I was pointed towards the, the, the provincial level trading companies and entities. Of course, they have the... the, the, the um, the mark, the, the export uh, licenses that come from Pyongyang. Naturally, the central government has control to that degree, but the control is not that strong, or it wasn't at the time. We're going back about five years now. Uh, not that strong over what these organizations necessarily do on a day-to-day -day basis. So how you deal with that in the context of a sanctions regime that by nature focuses on the central government and central government activity on the presumption um, that the central government knows all that's going on within its territory would seem to me to be problematic. So that was a very useful point to come out of Dr. Gray's presentation. Um, the only other point I would just want to throw in at the end here, I'll stop in about 20 seconds, is that it was good to see the use of uh, creative resources that don't get enough of an airing 
uh, in our research, in our field more generally. Uh, it was only one quote from a North Korean journal, Kyung Jae Yonggu, but I'm assuming that Dr. Gray has, has spent a lot more time uh, with his collaborators on reading that particular uh, August publication. Uh, and so it was really good to see that coming in alongside uh, quotes from uh, defector experts as well from inside North Korea. So in, on the whole, it was a great example of how we can marshal resources uh, to reach some kind of holistic analysis, you know, partial and, uh, and, and, and uh, problematic at the margins that may be, uh, certainly that can help guide our policy approaches as we go forward. So I'll leave it there so there's plenty of time for Dr. Milano to, to speak. Thank you very much, Christopher, for, for this excellent uh, discussion. And I'm very happy that you didn't cut back too much of what you were prepared to say. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marco, it's, it's your turn. Please. Okay. Thank you very much, Hannes. And thank you to all the organizers of this wonderful panel. It's a great opportunity for us to discuss these important issues. I'll try to stick to a few minutes of uh, my discussion, so maybe we'll have some time for some reply or maybe not, but I, I will try to be as short as I can. Um, I think all the four papers are extremely interesting and they propose extremely innovative analysis and issues. I was tasked to discuss only two of them, so I will save the questions for Sujin and Kevin for another time. I think that both in Nikki's and Virginie's uh, presentations, I found that this um, emphasis on aspects of development that are not connected to economic development is, is very important and often overlooked when we when you think about North Korea. So the, the fact that also human development and human security is very important and has to be looked at it, is, I think it's very, it's very important and I found that in, in both papers. I will start with just a few uh, comments, a few things that came to my mind regarding Virginie's paper. I think it's very, very interesting to propose this this comparison with Cuba, and, and also to propose this idea of um, uh, focusing on health and how Cuba was able to provide high-quality healthcare, uh, not only to their population, but also in a way to export this high-quality healthcare, despite of the sanctions regime that is in place uh, since the very beginning of uh, after the revolution and the, new, and the new regime that came after it. I think that a couple of aspects that can be put into the picture when we compare it to North Korea. The first is how we can include, in a way, or introduce the factor of the nuclear program. And um, this is because there, uh, these are two different, uh, very different kind of sanctions, I think, in the way that on one side, as you pointed out, on one side, sanctions against Cuba are mostly unilateral from the United States from the very beginning, because mostly because the United States felt Cuba as this geostrategic threat that uh, could not be tolerated. Okay, while on the other side we see that sanctions in North Korea are mostly related to the nuclear program. So um, is it more like towards a regime change, like in Cuba, or is it more towards trying to force North Korea to give up the nuclear weapon? So I think the fact that we have two different kinds of sanctions, in at least in terms of motivation, can be put into the picture to understand the two different developments, and also the fact that Cuba was under sanctions for many more years than North Korea. So I, I think this is one aspect that we can uh, include. And the second aspect I, I wanted to highlight is the problem of domestic legitimacy. To what extent providing high-quality health care can be seen as a source of domestic legitimacy for the Cuban regime, and not only health care, but providing basic goods and services to the population. Because we, we, we know that after um, the 1990s and the famine, this system collapsed in North Korea. So North Korea relied to other factors, also for domestic legitimacy. My opinion, for example, is that the nuclear program is part of the strategy of domestic legitimacy. Cuba, maybe it's different. Maybe this healthcare uh, system that works very well inside and outside of the country can be seen also as a factor for domestic legitimacy. So this maybe can be another, another interesting point to, to take into account. And one last thing is the external projection of Cuba's healthcare system, because it works great inside the country, it works great outside the country, and not only in terms of uh, quid pro quo, like 
we send doctors to Venezuela in exchange for oil at very low prices, but also in terms of prestige and image for Cuba. And not only in, in countries where, um, where, where we have like a similar regime, I'll give you just one example. In the first phase of the COVID-19 crisis, Cuba sent doctors and aides to Italy. And it was in the news for many days, and it was a very important, um, uh, how to say, actions in terms of improving the image of Cuba in the public opinion. So I think this uh, external projections work not only in terms of quid pro quo, but also in terms of enhancing, improving Cuba's regime, uh, sorry, Cuba's image towards the rest of the um, of the world. I have other things that I would skip for now. I, uh, I'd like only to ask one question, but probably we won't have time to answer it. Is that is um, my question is, uh, what are the possibilities for more healthcare cooperation between Cuba and North Korea in terms of COVID? We know that North Korea was not very responsive uh, to the offers of COVAX and also of South Korea. Given the, the fact that we have this strong relationship between the two countries, is there any chance that they might accept more aid and assistance from Cuba than from other countries? Since we know that Cuba is, is doing very well in terms of not only of curing COVID, but also in terms of research for vaccines and other things. So I just give you this question in the, in the air in case Virginie will not have the time to answer. And for Nikki's presentations, also very interesting, very in innovative, I think, introducing this idea of the Marshall-like plan. I especially like the idea of incorporating um, the concept of traditional knowledge in this. And I would like to hear more from you, probably not today, but I think it's, it's a very important point. Also, the idea of including uh, this small D development in this plan. I, I, I particularly like this, um, this approach. And one thing that is not very clear to me is that how this Marshall-like plan would work with the regime. I mean, are we talking about a plan that would be implemented after the regime? So regime change, sudden collapse, something like that. Or is this idea working also with the current leadership? So can we find like a way to make this Marshall Plan-like um, plan work with the current leadership? And this introduces a very important and problematic point, I think, because then we have to work with a regime that wants to keep control, obviously, and doesn't want its um, legitimacy to be destabilized by this plan. So maybe it's just me that I didn't really get the point of how this would work with the regime, but I think it's very important to look at this issue as well. And the other, the second point is that you opened up the Pandora's box of EU and North Korea. So what can the EU do with North Korea? Nothing, everything. I mean, now we have seen all kinds of analysis of what the EU can do with North Korea. I mean, I totally agree with you that the EU experience is a very important starting point in terms of how the Marshall Plan was used for European integration. And I also think that the EU has an economic and diplomatic potential to use some capabilities to do something to be more active. Also, the EU plus one, if, if we want to include the UK in this, they really have capabilities to do something there. But uh, we saw like a very small window of opportunity in which something was happening uh, in the very early 2000s. And then the EU mostly aligned with uh, the international community, or let's say the US. So what is the, the role that the EU can play here? I think that the experience of the EU and the potential of the EU can be very beneficial, but first we have to have the question why the EU doesn't do anything there. It's not very proactive there in spite of the fact that there are voices saying the EU can do more and there is a potential for doing more. So I think I can stop here. Uh, probably we don't have time to answer the questions, but I wanted just to throw them uh, here in the air. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marco. Also, again, very, very good discussion. Very interesting questions. <clears throat> I suppose the, the presenters will take home and uh, uh, think about, um, as uh, Marco pointed out, we, we don't have, unfortunately, the time for a last exchange here. Um, let me, at this point, at least um, the formal uh, panel, let me wrap up the, the, the panel. Um, I'd like um, to say that I, I very much enjoyed the, the presentations and uh, the, uh, 
yeah, intensive uh, discussion of those four presentations. And I think this session did not promise too much. This exchange indeed um, provided exciting stimulation of how, let's say, we think what is going on, how maybe to, to, to possibly think about changing <laughs> what's going on for, for the good and, and what possibilities there might be regarding the big question of what is to be done with North Korea. So uh, thank you again for um, the great input and discussion. And um, yeah, I, I think we also, some of uh, those in the panel here will have the opportunity to, to speak to each other in, in late October again, but uh, my, we are all connected. Um, so we can um, exchange on these interesting questions and issues and later on. So thank you again and, and have a good day.